pride, jealousy, anger, murder. No children were born to Adam and Eve in Eden. They labored with sweat of faith for quite a time before their firstborn came. Doubtless he was first marked with a jealous, unhappy disposition. Toil conduced to fretfulness in those who knew a happier lot in Eden. Fault finding with each other, resentment against the Creator, discontent with their lot probably marked their offspring pain. The world has since been under a reign of sin and death. Daughters also were born to them, and later another son, Abel, of a very different disposition from their firstborn. The experience of life may have mellowed their hearts. They remembered an intimation of hope connected with their sentence, namely, that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. Abel's disposition indicates that he had a contrite heart and desired to please God. If parents realize to what extent mental conditions affect their offspring, all would strive to bestow favorable birth traits on their children. Years passed. Cain and Abel were inspired by the promise respecting the seed of the woman and the hope for recovery by divine favor. They approached the Lord with offerings to receive a blessing. Abel's sacrifice of animal life God accepted because it typified the necessity for Jesus' death as the basis for forgiveness of sin. God's rejection of Cain's offering teaches that without shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin. Cain should have procured an animal for acceptable sacrifice in obedience to the divine will. Instead, he allowed anger, malice, hatred, and strife to burn in his heart and became a murderer. St. Paul says that Abel's blood cried to God for justice against Cain, but Jesus' blood cried to God for mercy on the sinner. Every injustice cries to God for justice. By a special covenant, Jesus and his elect church lay down their lives sacrificially for Adam and his race. The better sacrifices completed, restitution follows. What we have just seen surely has broadened our conception of our great Creator's wisdom, justice, power, and love. Let us arise and reverently join in one verse of that beautiful hymn, Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Abel, the first martyr. The word martyr signifies witness and is particularly used in reference to those who witness to the Lord's cause faithfully at the cost of suffering or death. Abel has the distinction of being God's first martyr. It is very remarkable that nearly all the martyrs have suffered at the hands of brethren. Thus, Jesus and the apostles received their persecution chiefly from Jewish brethren, sharers of the same blessed hopes and promises. How strange that it should be thus. Similarly, during this gospel age, Christians have suffered martyrdom at the hands of fellow Christians. Thus the scriptures foretold, saying, your brethren that hated you and that cast you out said, The Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. Every martyr in proportion to his faithfulness will ultimately receive a crown of life, while all persecutors will ultimately be ashamed. The reign of sin and death continued for 4,000 years before God sent his Son into the world to be its Redeemer and Deliverer. The Redeemer will set it free from bondage to sin and death, but he could not do so unless first he paid the death penalty, dying, the just for the unjust. During those 4,000 years, vague promises were given from time to time, but no start was made to fulfill them until Jesus appeared. Even those vague promises were confined to the Jewish nation. Outside nations, the Gentiles, received no promises of relationship to God. 
they were condemned sinners and no hopes were held out to them. As St. Paul says, they were without hope, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. For 6,000 years, according to St. Paul, we have had a reign of sin and death. Christians are still praying for the blessed day of Messiah, for Satan's binding. Then blessings will displace sin, sorrow, and death. Sorrow and mourning begun. The first death in Adam's family must have cast a great shadow. The hope centered in the divine promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head was temporarily snuffed out. Shortly after, Seth was born. His name indicates that his parents hoped that he would be the man promised of the Lord, not seeing that the promised one would be the Messiah who would come long afterwards and for whose work the world still waits. Although we speak of this as the first death, we must not forget that from the divine standpoint, Adam and his race were already dead, in that none can regain everlasting life except through the Redeemer's work of sin atonement. At present, the population of the world consists of 1,600 million, 90,000 dying every day. It is undoubtedly fortunate for our fallen race that we cannot appreciate deeply the sorrows and difficulties of others. Each individual, each family, has about as large a share of sorrow as it can properly bear. Indeed, the poet, realizing the folly of unrestrained grief, has well sung, Go bury thy sorrow. The world has its share. Go bury it deeply. Go hide it with care. Hope, joy, and peace come to us through the divine promise that the time is coming when there shall be no more sorrow or dying, no more sin or pain. For Messiah's kingdom shall conquer sin and death and cause God's will to be done on earth as fully as it is now done in heaven. Our experiences with sin and its penalty should make us all sympathetic. We should do nothing to add to the sorrow of others, but everything to relieve. The words of Jesus touch this chord of sympathy. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is no rest for the weary of heart except in union with Christ. Sons of God, daughters of men, long before man's creation, angels were created. Yet sin was unknown until Adam's day. The beginning of sin, according to the Bible, was in the Garden of Eden. Lucifer, an angel of very high rank, had long cherished in his heart ambitious designs. If opportunity ever offered, he would show God and the angels his grand scheme. His thought is expressed by the prophet, I would ascend above the stars, angels. I would be as the Most High, an emperor. When Lucifer beheld the first human pair, he was tempted to try his experiment. They were a new order of being in God's moral image. They had procreative powers which no angel possessed. Their offspring filling the earth would be his subjects, through whom he would work out his ambitious schemes. Thus Lucifer became Satan. God's opponent. All the holy angels were bewildered. His was the first rebellion against the Almighty's laws. No punishment followed, and the angels queried whether or not God was able to enforce his laws. Centuries rolled on. The human family was wasting. God's penalty, dying thou shalt die, was gradually being enforced. Satan realized that his kingdom of dying subjects would make but a poor showing ever. He conceived a plan to outwit God and develop a new order of being, hybridized humans infused with superior vitality. The angels possessed the God-given power of materialization. 
they could appear in human bodies resembling those of men. The Bible attests this. The angels were permitted contact with the fallen race to prove whether they could bring mankind back to God. The record of Genesis is that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took unto themselves wives of all they preferred. Thus the angels became the fathers of a new race, distinct from Adam. The record is that these were giants, physically and intellectually, men of renown who filled the earth with violence. While the ark was preparing, the disloyal course of the angels apparently continued for centuries without any outward manifestation of God's ability to check them. Thus all the holy angels were tested, and all who chose were disobedient in the days of Noah. Noah's family was singled out as exceptional in the statement, now Noah was perfect in his generation implying that few or no others were perfectly generated of pure Adamic stock. Noah's family, therefore, included all the uncontaminated, only eight persons. They, by divine command, built the ark, and thus witnessed to the world the divine intention respecting a deluge. Noah's message respecting a divine judgment by a deluge seemed ridiculous. Until the deluge, there was no rain. The last of the great rings which then flooded the earth was of pure water. For centuries it was spread out over the firmament. The whole earth was a great hothouse. There were practically no changes of season nor storm because the great water canopy preserved it in perpetual summer. Of that period we read, for as yet there was no rain on the earth. Noah, the preacher of righteousness, was mocked and considered a fool because of his faith in God's word, just as others of the Lord's people at various times have been mocked by those who lack faith and are yet mocked. Finally, the deluge came. The fountains of the great deep canopy were broken up. The breaking of the canopy precipitated millions of tons of water at both poles, forming two great tidal waves covering the earth for a great depth, deepening the ocean bed, and throwing up additional mountains. The cradle of the world is supposed to have been in Armenia. Geology tells us that the land of that vicinity was at one time a quiet, settling pond, as evidenced by heavy alluvial deposits. In this vicinity, the ark floated, and by divine protection landed on Mount Ararat its precious freight for the world's new star. Nephilim destroys the account of the fall of the angels from being sons of God to be demons helps us to understand why God decreed the deluge to wipe out all of the human race except Noah and his family. We perceive that God from the first intended to deal only with Adam and his family. The giant sons of the fallen angels, Nephilim, came into being contrary to the divine will. Hence, properly, no provision was to be made for them. They never had a right to life, nor will they have a resurrection. On the other hand, all of Adam's posterity, redeemed by Jesus' death, must be recovered from death, with full opportunity to secure everlasting life. After the deluge, the demon angels dematerialized, resumed their spirit condition. St. Peter and St. Jude reveal the penalty inflicted upon them. Those angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, spirit condition, God restrained under chains, restraints of darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. The liberties of the fallen angels, demons, were restrained. They are unable to use deceptions in the light, unable to materialize as formerly. Note, however, that the limitation unto implies that when the great day of wrath shall come, these fallen angels will be permitted to materialize and become potent factors in the strife. Other scriptures indicate that these fallen angels will have much to do with the great time of trouble with which this age will close and in which Messiah's kingdom will be inaugurated. These fallen angels were cast to Tartarus, 
our Earth's atmosphere. Satan, a cherub angel of higher rank, is styled the Prince of Demons. They are not in some far-off place stoking fires, but keep as close to humanity as possible. Not permitted to materialize, they seek to obsess, to demonize by clairvoyance and clairaudience. Mankind would properly resent them if their true character were known. They therefore personate the dead, communicating through spirit mediums. Thank <laughs> you.